What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. A dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James, and we're engaged and we like to get scared together. Yes, this week, oh boy, we're talking about the biggest thing on the planet right now, maybe? (laughs) Squid Game. Fucking Squid Game, dude. Here, oh, Lucy's outside. Ooh, Lucy, you want to play some Squid Game? Yeah, Lucy. No, we're not going to let Lucy play Squid Game. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so, okay, two things up front. One, the, I think this is the first time we're covering a TV show on the podcast. Yeah. So bear with us. And also to bear with us because we're smack in the middle of the busiest month of our lives, pretty much. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to do our best considering those two factors because I I really want to talk about Squid Game. Yeah, and we're not only talking about it because it's the biggest fucking thing in the world right now. No, no, no. So what – okay, so – well, you made you made a quick video saying that you weren't gonna do a kill count on Squid Game. Yeah, let me reiterate that for all the people tuning in for this podcast episode. Which yeah, sorry I ass- that this is. I'm sure some people thought this was a kill count. It's not. Hi, I'm Chelsea. If you have no idea who the <laughs> fuck I am, uh, let me assure those people that the podcast is the better medium to discuss something as sprawling and as layered as Squid Game. All right. So first off, right off the bat, you're welcome for this podcast. <laughs> but uh, secondly, yeah. Kill count. I would love to do it, man. We were just talking right before we rolled. Cinema summaries video just hit 19, 19 million, million views on it yeah. in like a week, and they're gonna surpass the highest viewed kill count, which yeah. is only at 20. Good 21. for them. Congrats. Good for to them. Cinema, they're nice dudes. They're nice dudes. Yeah. They uh, talked to me on Twitter, and they are uh, they are Asian gentlemen. I believe one of them. Oh in yeah, Malaysia. They, you said they cover a lot of Korean media, right? A lot of. Uh, Korean and Japanese, as the gods will, a lot of Asian media, okay. which uh, and specifically a lot of this death game media, which is its own kind of subgenre. It's its own, yeah, subgenre. Which it's so funny how whenever something like this comes out, immediately people are like, "This is a ripoff of blank." Usually battle royale people yeah. go to, and it's no. Usually they go for this is a ripoff of something else, which is a quote unquote ripoff of battle royale. Sure, yeah. but battle royale is often cited as like the death game, like it is kind of the watermark for this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and it's so funny because you never like i I wonder when we'll finally get over that because there's so many specific subgenres like you would you know like slashers are a subgenre which in and of themselves are all kind of like ripoffs of each i mean not all of them but you know what i mean yeah where we had the same basic structure yeah yeah exactly we had such a big like a glut of them in the 80s because they all realized it was something that people were really into and so I wonder if we'll finally get over, like, it's a ripoff of Battle Royale. It's like, all right, they, yeah. you know, we're all doing different stuff with them. So yeah, would love to do a kill count on it. It would probably do great. But this is nine hours of media that we're yeah. going to be talking about. That's uh, real difficult to compress into kill count format. I did it for Stranger Things. Took uh, a year off my life to do that. It took months, and we don't have that time right now because Squid Game came out of fucking nowhere. Just landed and... I think unlike some other Netflix properties maybe where they they really got big and flared up and then kind of died down quickly, I think Squid Game seems like the popularity is more organic. Sometimes with Netflix and their big hits, it seems kind of like they're the ones pushing it and they're having media write stories about it. But Squid Game, I think organically happened, came out of nowhere, no time to do a kill count on it. And especially the amount of research it would take. Uh, we had our research assistant, Bella, yeah. do a lot of work here. But, uh, I mean, between the the fact that it's a foreign language film with a lot of um, cultural background to discuss. I mean, I did my due diligence with Train to Busan. And that took a ton of time to not only research, but also to say the names properly. Because, uh, you know, neither of us are familiar yeah, with the Korean we're going to try our best yeah. here. Granted, the characters in this often go by nicknames or the numbers that they play as. We may so resort to the numbers. <laughs> Helps, yeah. Yeah, or main character. I always see MC. MC, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what you were kind of saying earlier is we're not even doing it just because we want to get on the Squid Game, the hype train. I guess. I mean, kind of, but. But no, I did. I watched this. I did watch it because I was like, well, everyone's talking about this thing. I want to know what people are talking about. And I 
put on the first episode, I finished the entire series in a day. I know. I just kept checking in on I, you and being like, How's I it had going? the day off and I was like, I'm never going to finish this if I don't watch it all today. Um, and each episode is such a cliffhanger. <laughs> so yeah. I um, watched it all in a day and told James, I am dying to talk about this because I, I genuinely think I'll. I, I, I was blown away by it. I think it's very good. I don't think it's overhyped at all. Um, even just the first episode, I was like, damn, this is really good TV. Yeah, I have this kind of natural aversion to things that are just really popular, especially this specifically, because I felt that like... The uh, pressure. The pressure and like, oh, I can't cover it on Kill Count, so I'm kind of bitter towards it that all these, it's all this hype that I can't jump in on. And so I was averse to Squid Game. I was like, that fucking Netflix thing. But then you watched it. You said it was real good. I watched half of Cinema Summer's video, unfortunately spoiling myself. I yeah. wish I hadn't. But seeing the visuals and how it looked, I was like, oh, this does look pretty good. So I watched it. I carved out the time to watch it so we could I'm do this. I'm so glad. I'm so excited to talk about it. It's going to be, I guess this, this episode is going to be less summary mm -hmm. of the series, by the way, because that would take forever. Um, It takes us forever just to do a summary of a movie. And also I think summary type reviews are less conducive to any good analysis that yeah. we want to do. I feel like summary reviews we tend to do when the movie's kind of shitty <laughs> and we're just goofing on it. Um, but this is going to be, I think, a lot more freeform and us just kind of talking about the series and we're going to jump all over the place. So if you haven't seen it... Yeah, go watch it. Go watch it. Yeah, this will be a way more interesting episode. And also, it's like the biggest thing on the planet right Yeah, now. get in and on that. I will say, like, it's a cool thing when something that is so huge is also something really good. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that I, I would hope that these big distributors and studios are going to take note of that, you know, to maybe have some more faith in what people like and what people are going to enjoy in terms of taking risks and doing something that's different and is, you know, maybe not, it's not happy. It's not a happy series at all. It's kind of amazing how... Um, I, I think I was just reading something about how a lot of marketing research has been kind of stifling for creatives right now because according to these marketing firms at studios and uh, distributors and stuff higher, they've been saying, well, people want something happy right now. People don't want anything too. I saw something about Black Mirror not doing episodes because like they don't want to add to the moroseness of yeah. culture. But <laughs> I think that there's kind of a... a a desire for that. I think it's maybe a catharsis to, I think a lot of people, myself included, I found this show really cathartic in terms of just the director intent and like what the showrunner, the creator is trying to say. And it just felt so um, honest and sincere and like really visceral and like was not holding back anything in terms of what this the philosophy is of the show and stuff. And I think, like, I I'm, I hope that it's not overlooked that people want that. And people are smart. Like, people, you know, we trust viewers, trust audiences. And, yeah, we don't need to baby people. Yeah, that is one heads up, though, if you haven't watched it. It is uh, heartbreaking and violent and not in, like, a gory way. No, but it's just a very, like, brutal, like, um... I think of so so going I, comparing it to Battle Royale, I guess. I think the opening of Battle Royale in the classroom where they mm -hmm. explain what's going on is still to me one of the scariest movie scenes in general because the mood of it is so weird, and all the kids realizing what the stakes are. Um, it's like that mood where it's just so like Frank. It's just all the death in it is just like the death in this is just so cavalier. I guess it's mm -hmm. just like. I don't know how to describe it. Like, it's not gory as much as it is just, like, really, like, stark and just, you know. It's upsetting, yeah. Yeah. I, I There was an episode. You hadn't watched it yet. I was in the, it was in the middle of my marathon. And if you've watched it, you know what episode it is. But I, after it ended, I walked into the, your, the office, and I'm just crying. And I was like, James, that was the most evil episode of TV I've ever watched. <laughs> So we'll talk all about that episode, which I think is a masterpiece, honestly, in terms of just like the emotion and the, the character stuff. That's something I love about this too. And and something that I'm like, I, I hope we're learning the right lessons from the success of this. This this series is so character driven. Yeah. And character stuff is my favorite um like 
TV movies. I love character studies. I like Mad Men is um, maybe my favorite show. It's hard to pick a favorite show, but Mad Men is all character stuff. And that's why like it, I find it so gripping is like, I don't need, um, you know, constant twist turns. Uh, like e the games themselves, the death game is kind of secondary to yeah. the character stuff in this. And I haven't watched a lot of these other recent death game media as the gods will which i believe is a japanese movie and alice in borderlands i keep hearing about that too, which i believe yeah. is a south korean show mm -hmm. i believe that those are both death trap movies that have more emphasis on the traps themselves and being like clever traps and and perhaps more emphasis on the people setting up the traps whereas you know i haven't seen those i'm sure they're good i hear about them all the time but uh the appealing thing about this type of media to me is definitely focusing on the people stuck in those traps yeah not so much the games themselves but the impact and the uh moral dilemmas that arise from these kinds of things yeah that's something that i enjoyed too so i <laughs> i'm not like i wouldn't call myself a gamer by any means <laughs> i i if i have free time i play i play games but that is what i liked about um our, my friends recommended both danganronpa which i love i have a monokuma plushy on my side of the office and uh the zero escape trilogy also those are both like death game type premises also i think you are a gamer i think that you're probably reluctant to call yourself a gamer because of a outdated notion of what a gamer is i feel like I you're guess. i feel like you're i feel like you think you can't say you're a gamer unless you're playing first person shooters at a <laughs> land party which that's not the case anymore you play more games than me I guess, but I would never be able to be like a Twitch gamer. It would be me like slowly solving puzzles and like <laughs> doing logic stuff in my head. People would watch it. I guarantee oh, it. Man, it would not be very interesting. <laughs> um, lots of like strategy, like I like Crusader Kings, where it's me just quietly like deciding which of my duchies I should be taxing more. <laughs> like cool, very exciting. Um, should we move into the full on spoiler filled review? Yeah, at we're this gonna point? just ruin this whole thing. So yeah, so make sure you go watch up. it if you haven't already and now we'll get into it yeah um i feel like this review and this discussion is gonna be <laughs> i was just talking a lot about like the evils of capitalism because that's what this that's what the movie, series the show is. is that's yeah. what the the intent is um uh, what i'm looking at the creator's name yeah so uh, i'm gonna try my best here huang dong hyuk yeah that's yeah huang dong hyuk i yeah. think um, yeah, so apparently he came up with this idea more than a decade ago, and he was living with his mom and grandma, Makes um, sense. Yep. and investors were hesitant to, uh, take it up because it's so brutal. And so even a decade ago, and it's, it's interesting because a decade ago, I would say Hunger Games, Hunger Games was huge. It's and still big, yeah. I did know, um, when I was kind of doing my own little, you know, research for this, that I think it's so fascinating that... Hunger Games was so huge post recession, like that, because that first book came out in two thousand eight. I checked. Did it? Yes, the first Hunger Games book came out in two thousand eight. Whoa! Yeah, I'm, good I know. Timing. It's like a little on the nose. Right? Were all those books written before the movies began, or was it a concomitant thing? I think all the books were out before the movies. Damn. Came out. I think. I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, that first movie was twenty twelve. I think because okay. I was just looking at this, but. It is interesting that yet again, one of, you know, the big, arguably the biggest thing right now is during this like COVID economy, like the world, I mean, the supply chains coming to a halt, like everything is so disrupted. People are out of work at like record levels. And um, I think it's, it's interesting looking at like when these become really popular, but it's kind of bizarre that when Hunger Games was so big, no one you know bit at this apparently when he was um i saw this anecdote a bunch uh when i was doing my research too but he had to stop writing the script because he had to sell his laptop for cash just to get by mm -hmm. um that i mean yep yeah, that's kind of the path of being a creative unless you have like some kind of connection or help is like struggle 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 and then like something just hits okay Hopefully. you know if you're lucky yeah because it's cutthroat trying to make it you know whether you're a writer or i wanted to work in post-production it's you know i it's hard so i think that's also why i relate to this show a lot because you can like 
this creator's struggle is all over this show. Like, and it's something where if you've lived it and that not even just in entertainment in general, you don't forget what that feels like. And I, of course, that's going to inform his art. And he directed it as well, right? Uh, yes. So I, I think that the content of the show and the writing is solid. Uh, I think the visuals of it is what made it take off so much. A combination of the two. I think it was a bit of both. It wouldn't work without one or the other. The visuals of the show are kind of what drew me into wanting to watch it is seeing the screen grabs everywhere of just these like pastel, like marshmallow colored, (laughs) like the playground and the stairs that look like a St. Vincent music video. It's the M.C. Escher drawing. Yeah, Yeah. it's the the labyrinth stairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the guys in the pink suits, just all the weird little visuals. I was so drawn in and I wanted to know more because it just looks so different than everything, especially big stuff with tons of money behind it that is coming out now. This is like the opposite of kind of CGI mush, which is one of my biggest pet peeves. I, If something is CGI mush, I probably won't watch it. And by that, I mean where mostly everything is a green screen and everything is just mocap or like CG. And there's something about like, you lose so much color. I don't know what, like why, but I just think of all like the big blockbusters right now are just so, like everything just feels so muted and like muddy and... This is not what this feels like. This feels so, like, the use of color is so deliberate. And I think they even said making this, they tried to rely um, on CG and stuff as little as possible, Mm -hmm. which you can definitely tell. And I think, like, I I can't believe the stairway set is a real thing. Yeah, that's awesome. And even the simplicity of the dorm room they're in is visually striking Mm -hmm. with all the beds stacked up in a staggering pattern, like steps. I thought that was really interesting. And then as the show goes on and the contestants are eliminated, the beds are removed. And so, like, at the end, you have the three beds up against opposite sides of the wall. That's so, like, I don't know. It's such a cool marker for the progression of the story. And it just looks awesome. And and it it really puts you in that position. Yeah. It transports you back to, like, high school auditoriums and gyms where people all had to gather. Yeah, and just like the loneliness of being at the top too, of you've made it, but at what cost kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And I do like too that as the beds are removed, there's the pictures on the walls of what all the games are going to be. I'm like scrolling through our chat and it's just all these memes of like Jeff Probst being like, well, I know what you're playing for. And I'm I'm Squid Game. (laughs) Um. Yeah, I have this quote from, and oh man, I need to find where I got this from. Stupid me not also sending you my source in just our private Facebook chat. <laughs> but this is a quote from, from the creator. He says, I wanted to write a story that was an allegory or fable about modern capitalist society, something that depicts an extreme competition, somewhat like the extreme competition of life. But I wanted it to use the kind of characters we've all met in real life. As a survival game, it is entertainment and human drama. The game is portrayed are extremely simple and easy to understand. That allows viewers to focus on the characters rather than being distracted by trying to interpret the rules. You know, I guess we haven't really like talked about the broad uh, structure of the show and sure. how it is such a giant metaphor for capitalism. And yeah. I mean, assuming you've watched the show, you know what it is. Uh, 456 people are put in a situation where they're playing games, a round of six games, and then as the show goes on, it's revealed that uh, they're they're doing this for the benefit and entertainment of the VIPs, very rich, masked men who are uh, never, your fa- their faces are not yeah, really seen. Yeah, except the one guy. Mm-hmm, who You see all of him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and so the whole situation is obviously, you know, a metaphor for capitalism. At the very basic sense, it's how the upper class uses uh the pits the lower class against each other to distract them from the real issues all with the promise of if you succeed in beating your fellow lower class brethren you will win money and that's what it's all about we actually we talk a lot about um like 20th century korea in our episode on the host if you're interested in that so i'm not going to reiterate a lot of that stuff granted that has to do a lot with like America's military involvement in Korea, but I think it still gets into like Korea's economy and why they became 
um, basically modeled after us, like modeled after an American style capitalist economy. And therefore, I think why the show is popular here. It's we we live in very similar economic structures and deal with a lot of the same things. And um, they they deal also with this idea of everyone for themselves. It's everyone, um, you know, just like in Squid Game, uh, societally, economically, culturally, it's like you against everyone else. It's this fight to the top. And yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, that's the other thing. The Squid Game is obviously a critique of capitalism and the, uh, the, the downsides of that system, but also a critique of the kind of steadfast individualism that a lot of people, especially in the United States, have that mentality of like, just looking out for number one, baby. And to get ahead, you have to put other people down. And I mean, that's reflected in each of the games. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, the red light, green light, which is not actually what it is in Korea. Uh, I forgot yeah. the phrase. That oh, the I forget what it, I was trying to look up what it translated to. And I was having a hard time because all I kept finding was like remixes of the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. It's like red rose something. But I think my understanding of that game is the person has to say that phrase. And then when they turn around, if they catch you moving, as in the show, yeah. you're eliminated. So not quite red light, yeah, green light. Yeah, but it's still translated. It translates It is great. kind of yeah, amazing how a lot of these games like it, it, it's a weird thing where kids almost come up with such similar things. It's, it seems like almost independently. It, it reminds me of how you, I'm trying to think of an example, like weird things that you did in elementary school that like, how the fuck do kids everywhere know mm -hmm. this thing? I can't think of a good example of it. I'm not sure. Yeah. Like, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I, good thing I'm like all the way over here. You can't punch me. Yeah, I did the circle below my waist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she looked. <laughs> I did look, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and that's true to Dong Hyuk's intention of having these games so simple that it translates well to other cultures, even if you're not familiar with, like the honeycomb game. We don't have that. Yeah, that's something that where that felt, at first I was like, wait, what? Because the, the one guy gets a hint and he's it's like honeycomb and he instantly knows what it is. And I'm like, oh shit, am I? And yeah, Song Wu is perhaps the best iteration of this critique. He is he is I'm the obsessed with this character. He is the embodiment of I am only going to look out for myself because even that's the second game and he's made this pact with the, his friends, his childhood friend and these other friendly people and even then he's not telling them, "Oh, pick the triangle. That's going to be the easiest one to cut out." He is just looking out for himself and he shows some remorse when uh, uh, the main character, whose name I don't have in front of me, chooses Umbrella. Yeah, four, five, six. Four, five, six, yeah. He chooses Umbrella, the most difficult yeah. shape, and he almost says something, but, but he, he doesn't, doesn't because he wants to get ahead himself. I think his character is extremely... I, do, I just want to talk about all the characters and what I think they kind of represent in terms of like how they how they deal with themselves being in the game, how they got there, mm -hmm. um, their backgrounds. But I think the businessman, um, is, is he 216, 218? Uh, Song Wu is Song Wu. his name is uh, easier for sure. me to say. Yeah. Song Wu we we learn is in so much debt because he like embezzlement and he was ripping off clients and stuff. When you compare how he ends up basically putting himself in this game um, to everyone else, it's a stark contrast. When we have um, we learn that our main character is having such money troubles because he got uh, fired after going on strike at his his auto plant. Um, and he tried to start his own business, which failed, and then he becomes addicted to gambling. Mm -hmm. um, then you have this other character who is a refugee from North Korea who's just trying, you know, she needs money to find her family. Like, all everyone else has these stories where, I guess except yep. Snake, the tattoo. I just keep calling him Snake because he yeah. looks like Snake from The Simpsons. Yeah, but. Ali is an immigrant yes, who's having exactly. his wages withheld from his boss. Yes, mm -hmm. and so when you look at what their situations are compared to Song Wu, there's a contrast there in terms of why they're having such money problems. Song Wu's is because he's preyed on other people before. Yeah, he was in the upper class and then took... Uh, it, unethical gambles that didn't pay off. And this, you know, talking about this makes me think of when we do bailouts or yeah. uh, other kind of, um, you know, financial assistance programs and not only do the people who truly need them get them, but also 
people who, you know, uh, took big financial gambles and they didn't work out. And then they're like, well, I would also like that, please. Yeah. And he, so I, I think just the fact that he is already this kind of upper class, you know, businessman, I think is such a bit, it, like, it's such a tell. And in retrospect, you're like, why am I surprised that he ended up being such a fucking, you know, just like so out for himself. I mean, he's responsible for one of the most devastating deaths in the show. It, it just gutted me. Like, I mean, they set up Ali to be your favorite for a fucking reason. They want <laughs> you to hurt. Dude, Ali has such a smiley face. He's so sweet. He's such a sweet boy. I know. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that character. I, I think he's so great. And I love his friendship with our main character. Uh, and Gihan. And I I think, um I guess we can talk, you know, the main character, because I think he is so, I love how complicated he is. I think what made me really like this first episode is how well he is set up as a protagonist. Because at first, when you meet him, you're like, this fucking guy is a <laughs> mess, right? Like, you see, I think they portray gambling addiction so, so well. Just the... Stealing money from his mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and she had to change the pin yeah. of the ATM just because of him. And it's, you get all these things right up front where you're like, this guy's fucking say stealing from his mom, right? Yeah. Like, it's, you're set On up his daughter's birthday. Yeah. Yeah, and then you start to see things where you're like, oh, I I feel bad for you. I, I get that he has, like, a problem, you know? Um, like, when he runs into the, the pickpocket originally, he knocks over her drink, and he's running for his fucking life, but he still stops and is like, oh, my God, and he picks up her drink and gives it back to her. Mm -hmm. And he picks up the straw, too, which was an improvised thing yeah. from the actor. Yeah. And so it's just little things where you, I, I think it's, the show does such a great job of establishing that he is not like at his core he's not a bad person he just he's complicated like he's human he um obviously is a fuck up like we said he's, he steals money from his mom and you know like even in the process of trying to get his daughter a present for her birthday has to turn it into like a gamble with the mm -hmm. the fucking crane game right? which the thing he gets looks like the caskets later on it it's does a, it's yeah. a box with a bow and then there's a gun lighter inside which mm -hmm. you know could signify death yeah exactly yeah, yeah um that's a very funny moment though <laughs> i know when he gives his daughter the gun. gun yeah i laugh like <laughs> and then he tries these uh it's so you can protect yourself and then it's a lighter like, yeah where he tries to spin it is like someday there won't be any discrimination between men and women <laughs> yeah. and women can join the military and you see that like he he's like a classic um he's such a character that i i going back to mad men i had the like kind of flashback to scenes with him and his daughter where like he fucking saw don draper don draper yeah, yeah where where you can tell that, like, you know, especially when she's younger, he, in contrast to the mom, is like, we're going to go out and do some, like, fun stuff. And we get to eat junk food that, you know, she even says, like, mom doesn't let me eat this stuff. So it's fun. To, you know, they get to go have, like, you know, street, like, cart food. And he, he's not a bad guy at all. He's not a bad guy he's at a, all. He's I would human. say he's a good guy. I think he's, I'd say he's a good guy overall, with an issue. Well, especially, you know, I, I think the, the ultimate thing in his his defense is like i think he's suffering from ptsd i don't think the show really dwells on it which i don't think it needs to i think you you pick up on it and you get it when he when he talks about um the fact that he went on strike and watched his friend die in front of him um he i i apparently i did not know that this is based on there was a, a strike that happened at a um a plant in korea uh, what was the name of it yeah, so apparently this is uh, the financial crisis in Korea in 2009. That's that's when the creators started working on this series. There, um, there also were a bunch of layoffs at Sangyong Motors um, as a result in a change of ownership, which is also the case in the show, which led to a massive strike. And so our main character's talking about how um yeah he was on strike and got laid off at this plant he was working at and he occupied the factory floor um and was on lookout which is how he you know he's having kind of flashbacks to this as he's up every night kind of keeping watch on the other contestants because there's some <laughs> snake from the simpsons is there and he's scary and he he we basically, in a scene that I think is gorgeous, where he sees playing out in front of him the, like, smoke bomb that kind of rolls out, and they see the the riot squad. Um, he, his friend gets killed right in front of him, and he can't do anything about it. And it's really... Um, I think I also just have an affinity for it, because that's part of my family history as well. My grandpa... Uh, 
he occupied um, a Chrysler factory in the, the 40s. And that's something that, you know, I grew up always hearing stories about him. My dad also is a factory worker who's gone. So it just, I don't know. I think for me, especially because he is like a dad mm -hmm. in the show, I... That whole like anecdote, I was crying because it just hit home, you know. And that's the most pivotal thing to his backstory because that one event not only set the path for his employment issues, which are the reason he joins the game, it also uh, was the start of his familial problems because it was uh, due to that strike that he missed the birth of his daughter, yes, which led yeah. to the estrangement with his wife and divorce and uh, the difficulties with his daughter. Yeah, and I think the fact that his story is so... Um, informed by being on strike too, because a strike, when you're when you're on strike with fellow workers, you are putting other people before yourself. You are sacrificing money. So we see in his backstory, he has put other people before money. Um, that is like a, a key part to his character, where he, at his core, is a person who is willing to do the right thing for other people compared to someone like Song Wu, who I don't think, I think he would be the first to cross a picket line. <laughs> yeah, for sure. He would be a scab, scab like Wu. that. <laughs> scab Wu, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly for sure. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I just, I can't get over how, how great I think this main character is. And I think that that really informs how the show ends, which a lot of people don't like. Yeah, because it's, kind of his trait it's told to him that he doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut mm -hmm. that he he's kind of an idealist person who uh will take things so far like take his ideals so far that they begin to negatively impact his own personal life as we saw with his backstory and yeah as we see at the very end when instead of getting on a plane to go see his daughter in the united states he turns around and sets up for a sequel series i guess by yeah going to, uh, i hope i there's I Definite. There is no world in which there's not more Squid Game after the I don't success need it's had. It. It we ended don't need great. it. It should have. I think. Uh, I think it ended with a sequel in mind. I think it shouldn't have, uh, and it would have been a great one season. But I feel like they probably figured that there was a chance for another yeah. series, and now for sure there's going to be after that success. I actually. Here's the thing. I love Squid Game. I think after those first six episodes, it dips in quality. It dips a little bit. I think the last three episodes left me a little uh, deflated mm -hmm. after the high I was riding for those first six episodes. Sure. The, the only issues I have in those first six episodes is probably the way the uh, riot in the dorm is shot. I think it's a very... I don't like the strobe. Yeah. It's too strobe before me, and I can't see what the fuck's going watch, on. I yeah. think it's a very important thing that happens, uh, that has to happen for the story and thematically. Yes. You know, you need this breakdown of, like, why aren't we just killing each other I mean, to... it, it is the literal, like, manifestation of what we do at, at large, where it's, like, the upper class is always going to pit us against each other. Yeah, and... it's like the agent provocateurs, yeah. where they're, like, they let it happen. They, they mm -hmm. encourage it and, you know, want it to happen, and then we'll step in when they deem it necessary yeah. for their enjoyment to be like yeah. no 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 and stop, it's stop. also it, it puts you in the position of like oh thank goodness the the authority is here yeah and it makes you want authority because mm -hmm. they're gonna keep the peace yeah so that was literally just the strobing was my only yeah, complaint yeah, about yeah. the first six episodes after that though man and this is not a unique complaint episode seven is the one with the fucking vip i'll defend the vips you... i'm ready i'm okay. ready to go okay. with matt for them here's the thing though all right vips uh awful awful dialogue and i know that the the shitty jokes about 69ing and the frat bro uh dialogue and mentality i understand that that's intentional and i understand why the performances are a little weird because they're shooting in south yes. korea yeah, yeah. They, they don't have uh, Western white actors who are trying to make it big there, so their their pool is smaller to draw from. And then there was a post from one of the actors who played one of the VIPs who was like, wait a minute, this line about, oh, it's bigger with the model and the bridge. He was like, that doesn't make sense. I, that was such a funny anecdote. Yeah, it's being directed by non-native English speakers. Sure, yeah. So their deliveries and some of the dialogue is going to sound a little off. I'm okay with all that. My problem with the VIPs is when the dialogue is the ham-fisted exposition shit that we don't need. When they're talking about player motives or the way the game works, 
when we just had six episodes without that. Mm, we don't need mm-hmm. it for this. It's obvious how the bridge works. It's obvious the players thinkings and, and their motivations. So those are the lines that killed me because there were just so many of them cutting back to the players being like, oh, uh, they're deciding whether to go first or last and they're having a hard time deciding. It's like, I can see yeah, that. Yeah, and I don't we do that. have that play out also with the kind of voiceover with the main character of like, do I pick number one? Do I pick 16? Yeah, that's the only episode where, where we he's hear got voiceover. Like, yeah, voiceover. that is, inter- that is so kind of weird. Episode seven really uh, I could took see the wind out of my sails. taking away like, you know, a lot of that exposition dialogue from the VIPs and just making it an episode shorter. Yeah, exactly. Because they already have that weird half hour episode, too. Episode eight's half hour for um, some reason. But overall, like, I think the the VIPs, because I, I think a lot of people's complaint about them is, like, they're too, like, they're stupid and they make dumb jokes and they're they're crass. Like, they're not... Um, Bond villains. Yes. And mm-hmm. I, I think that a lot of people's idea of the wealthy in real life is a lot more... um, Sophisticated? Yes, than the truth actually is. I think um, we wrongly assume that wealthy equals smart. Wealthy, like, think of the way that... Like, why is Bill Gates an authority on, like, random... Like, we, he's always, like... Like talking about, um, I forget what I was just reading. Uh, he was commenting on like something, and I'm just like, this guy built compute. Like, it's just such a weird thing that once you get to a certain level of wealth, you're allowed to just make choice, like decisions, and yeah, just pontificate drive. on everything. Yeah, it's like you're allowed to just talk about whatever the fuck because you invented like a computer chip or just some like weird thing, or like you are Warren Buffett and you got good at like real estate shit. It, it's just bizarre, and so I think we have this like false idea of like wealthy equals intelligent when in reality the wealthy are just a bunch of fucking bros i i think of um google look up peter nygaard um actually the podcast friends of the show eat the rich have a very good series about peter nygaard it is very um upsetting i will warn you he was um arrested on charges of like sex trafficking and Mm. um but he um, is this kind of new money, um, can they, like, I think Swedish, Swedish Canadian, like clothing designer. He built this, like, it looks like a, like a Disney park and it's just the tackiest. And there's like people, um, I guess like investigators took like covert videos and shit. And it just is the, it's like, it's like one of the VIPs in real life. Like he's not a clever man. He's gross and immature. He's making similar jokes. I just think. Like, that's so much closer to the reality of what this class of people is like than maybe this, yeah, like, Bond villain idea. Of yeah, because you can get super rich being great at one thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily make you good at anything else. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess I will defend the VIPs in terms of, like, their, their character. I think that it, they're intentionally really crass. And I think the contrast between the jokes that they make and certain things that happen is, like, really devastating. There were a few times where it, like hit me really hard that um like player 96 i think he's is he the tempered glass guy no i forget which but there's a player like it's this whole thing that plays out and it's really devastating and then they cut back and they're just cracking jokes and the way that they're just it's just all a game to them and i i i think it is intentional that they only show up halfway through the series because you mentioned you thought it was weird that they're not there the whole time they're they're catching the wrong games honestly (laughs) red light green light and uh uh the honeycomb ones are going to be way more entertaining to watch if you're this psychopath person than i don't know the bridge one is pretty yeah but it's it's got that 16 minute time limit on it so it's 16 minutes tug long, no matter war, what. Right, tug of War would be better watch. to watch instead of they show up just for a 16-minute bridge thing and then a one-on-one squid game. Like, sure. cool, guys. Well, I don't know, because I was thinking, like, huh, yeah, like, why wouldn't they be there the whole time? But I think that that's just another way to, to show that none of this, like, this is just a dumb gambling thing to yeah. them. Like, this is not, you know, this is, this is I compare it to, like, uh, someone who's got front row seats for like the finals of a s- season of sports <laughs> and isn't there the whole time, but mm-hmm. you've got the f- a really expensive front row seats because you have to be there for like the last game. You yeah. know, you're not gonna. I, that's what I thought of anyway. They're not like you know 
dedicated sports fans they just want the status of being there for the the end of it you know sure yeah it is a status thing for sure yeah i love the design too of the the vip like section with the snake the ladies who are all painted as snakes and yeah. like the one lady with who's like a leopard and he's like laying on her boobs i didn't even realize that they blend in so well with the background it's very the ornate cool room that they're in i lo- and, and like their masks are very cool i would love to have oh the vip masks yeah they're, i like them a lot mm-hmm, the yeah. gold animal masks mm-hmm yeah, what kind of animal would you have? Ooh, uh, an otter. Oh, an otter, that would be <laughs> with like little cute little front teeth. Yeah. Hey, I want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, Dadgrass. So I have talked in here before about how much I love CBD products. I use CBD for sleep, relaxation, anxiety. I personally find CBD very helpful. And Dadgrass is legal, organic, smokable hemp. So they are pre-rolled joints that are really high in CBD very low in THC, so you're not gonna get stoned smoking these at all. You're not gonna get high. You're gonna have a super clear head the entire time, just enjoying the benefits of CBD. In fact, all Dadgrass products are federally legal for ages 21 and over, and they ship right to your door anywhere in the US. I've been enjoying these before bed. I found they've actually helped me get some sleep (laughs) this month. I've been so thankful to have these on my bedside table when I need them. So if you want to try Dadgrass, which I love the name so much, the little curtains they all come in is super cute too. Dadgrass is offering our listeners 20% off your first order when you go to dadgrass.com slash deadmeat. One more time, that is dadgrass.com slash deadmeat for 20% off your first order. And again, that is dadgrass.com slash deadmeat. You know, you know who we haven't talked about one bit yet? The old guy. The old man. We have to talk about him. Um, The old man who, again, this was one of the reasons why the end of the show really disappointed me. That reveal at the end, I think. Gutted. I felt so betrayed. I felt betrayed. And honestly, I don't know. It felt cheap to me. It It felt like a twist just to have a twist. I guess. I mean, I I did feel a bit like, oh, why would they take? Yeah. Because I was sobbing all of episodes and six, I'm, and which is marbles by the way which is an amazing it's episode. an amazing episode one yeah. of the things before we talk more about the old man one of the things about the marbles episode that really gets me is and you said the same thing for you the thing that made me openly weep was not the death of ali which was really painful yeah. and not the death of the old man or the implied death but the death of the other young girl yeah. who had only been introduced in episode or two prior. Yeah. They did so much with her so quickly. And by the end of that episode, just the way she goes out, like thanking, uh, I forget the name of the oh, uh, player. The 62, pickpocket. The pickpocket. Yeah. Thanking her for just playing with her and then getting shot in the head. Fuck. I that's Fuck when I, I started up, sobbing. Yeah. Thank you for playing with me. Lost it. There's so much fan art of those two, by the way, going to the island that they talk about oh, and yeah. having uh mojitos. Cause yeah, she keeps saying, like, oh, when we when get we, out of here, we'll go. Oh, oh. Yeah. And then she corrects herself. And I just that whole, yeah. Um and I don't know like what to even say about it. It's just such great character work. Like Marvel's The game itself is the fact that they're even like, you just have to get your opponent's marbles. You can decide the rules. Shows really how unimportant the games are to this show. The fact that one of them in the, I think the best episode, the game is, has no fucking rule. They're just like, you figure it out. Yeah, Snake switches his rules halfway through. Yeah, I have seen some people point out, and I did have this thought too, that the rules as stated are, you need to have all your of your opponents, opponents. 10 marbles. So what, can anyone just, can they just, our game as we switch? But that could be a translation thing, which we also it have to could talk be a about. Translation because I thing, yeah. think I saw some people say that their translation said you have to end up with 20 marbles. Okay. So uh, there have been some discussions about the accuracy of the subtitles. Mm-hmm. And complicating matters more is the fact that there are two sets of English subtitles. There's English, yeah. which just subtitles. It is a translation of the Korean dialogue. And then when there is the English dialogue, there's nothing on screen. As someone who often watches things with subtitles, uh, as soon as the English dialogue started happening and I, I couldn't read it, I switched to English closed captioning. 
That gives you subtitles for all dialogue, including the English, but the translations from the Korean lines is different. Which one is supposed to be better? I believe that the English subtitles, not the closed captioning, is the more accurate translation okay, that's of what, what I they're did. trying to say. But in both cases, you're going to have idioms and expressions that, you know, don't necessarily translate. And it's just simpler to uh, to simplify them. I saw that in one country, I forget which one, the subtitles just translated all the insults to dirtbag. Like, no matter what it was, oh, whether it was like a super insult uh, or just like a, a passing by like, ah, you, you jerk. It was all dirtbag. And one one thing that stood out to me was I saw someone say that there's a line, I I believe about Gihan, the main character, where it's, you're the type of person who doesn't know you're in trouble until you're in trouble, something yes, like that. Yes, I was reading about this too. Yeah, and the original Korean line translates more accurately to something like, you're the kind of person who doesn't know the difference between like being paste, being paste and, and shit, shit until, you, until you're eating you it or something You taste it like to that. make sure it's not shit. Yeah. Yeah, um, apparently that's a really common expression. And that's so much more colorful and expressive. I know. And we don't get that in the translation, but at the same time, you know... You, translations are never 100% between languages. No, they it's, can't be. Yeah, they, they can't literally be. can't be. So you have to take some liberties and do what's best for the story and what's best to convey the same tone and meaning to the, your audience. Yeah. Did they do that? I don't know. You I don't also, speak I think, have to consider the amount of time the audience has to read something yep. where if – in the native language, it's a quick, you know, it, it doesn't take as long as, you know, when you translate it, maybe it's a lot wordier mm -hmm. and you don't, like, there's, I think there's a lot to consider um, when you're translating something where it's like it, timing and everything. It's, yeah, it's tough. But yeah, I think what's interesting is all of the, um, yeah, the stuff that you, you literally can't translate, like the kind of um, terms in Korean for like just different, um, like levels of uh, formality and stuff. Oh yeah, like with you're Ali with Sir in the translation, Songwoo just ends up asking Ali, I think, to call him just his name instead of Sir. Which you know, I like, I get what they're going for, but I, apparently in the like original language, it's like he asks him to call him like a term that basically translates to brother, um, which is so right before Ali gets shot he says like you you know brother and mm. it's, so it's like that's something that someone pointed out is like it makes it a bit more heartbreaking that it's this you know it's he's not just saying song woo he's saying he's calling for brother and Got gets it. shot and oh that <laughs> that episode is so gorgeous it's just like such good character work yeah like i i didn't even think about it but the fact that you mentioned that they introduced this one character like just a couple episodes before and you feel so hard for these two and um man i i i think something that oh wait should we should we go back to talking about the old man <laughs> we, we kinda, did yeah sorry i i warned this episode's gonna be all over the place there's a lot it's to a talk lot about of stuff yeah yeah so the reveal of <laughs> our the old man being behind the entire thing yeah i i do remember being really frustrated like i get the whole um wanting to do it because when you're that rich everything's, everything's boring. boring yeah so might as well like risk your life i understand that and that totally makes sense to me i think that's a valid and interesting like idea to bring yeah, in and motivation sure. it's just i don't know man i know I, and it, maybe it is just me feeling like hurt and betrayed which was the point of it mm -hmm. and maybe it is a good story decision and i'm just reluctant to admit that because i want to like that character but god damn it I want to like that character. I know. It's, uh, yeah, that he wants to just play all these games. And yeah, the fact that I always think of it as like the feeling, like, I don't know if you, did you play The Sims a lot? No. It's the feeling of playing The Sims and just doing the cheat code for unlimited money. That game gets boring so fast. Yeah. Like once you unlock everything, it's like, oh, uh, and I just imagine that that's what your whole life feels like when you're mm -hmm. that wealthy. Um. Yeah, I don't know. And I I guess, like, just the generational thing, too, of, like, I think that's something that people our age experience with people who are older and grew up in, like, a different... Granted, it's different because we're American, but 
um, things that were easier for our parents' generation in terms of being able to support yourself and, um, you know, buying a house, buying necessities. And often there's this disconnect between, you know, maybe like our parents saying like, well, why don't you, you can just cold call and get a job, you know, because it, it's it's just different. And us having to explain like, no, like it's legitimately, a, a di it's the wild fucking West. Now. It's like a totally different experience trying to earn money for a house or being able to afford to have children, things like that. Um, so I think maybe that's why it's like the old man is just this generational gap. Because the old man even says, like, you know how hard it is to make money um, when he's they're having their conversation at the end. And I think he's he's referring to, like, the uh, trials of winning the big jackpot of the game, but also, you know, just in general. But to him, I, I think his his concept of, oh, it's hard to make money is it's hard to like make all these decisions to fuck other people over where maybe to someone like our main character no the difficulty of making money in life is the making any money period you know finding a job or keeping your restaurant open and stuff like what's difficult to these characters is completely different and they also just have such different ideas of what humans are at their core which i think is a really interesting part of that whole scene and why I do kind of like it as much as I feel betrayed by that reveal. I do love the the whole like humans are um are intrinsically selfish versus no humans are capable of good. And the show comes down on the side of Gihan with Absolutely. humans are good. And that's again a defining characteristic of the main character is like I mentioned before, I think it's really important that he was a uh, uh, a factory worker on strike putting other people before himself I think that's why he goes back at the end when he realizes there's another squid game like he you know his daughter as much as like his desire like his number one desire is to be a better father but bigger picture he cannot let there be another squid game he even stops the one guy from he takes the card away from yeah. the guy who he sees at the subway who is once again uh being Recruited by the guy from Train to Busan. Yeah, yeah. A very handsome gentleman. Super name, handsome. I yeah. Um, uh, I also found in the last scene with the old man, um, the old man dies right before the bet is decided. The old man dies. How does he die? It's ambiguous. Yeah. But, you know, he's the old man is saying the last things he says is like, oh, looks like you were wrong. And then at the very last minute, the cops pull up to help this homeless man out. And Gihan, like, turns to the old man who is now dead, and he's like, you saw that, right? You saw yeah. that you lost. And I think that that's interesting in the sense of, like, you know, we have a whole bunch of uh, old people right now who have done evil things or who have made uh, billions of dollars, and, yeah, they're going to die. Yeah, but, like, but they won. But they won. Yeah. You know? Yes. Fucking I, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger won. He's, like, in his 90s. It doesn't matter it doesn't what matter. happens to him. If he goes to jail for the last few years of his life, yeah. which he won't, or As much as dies. I'm going to be, like, so excited that he's burning in hell <laughs> after he dies, he still won. Like, he, you know. They got away with it. He got know? away with it. And I think that the, the old man dying like that, where it's, like, he didn't even mm -hmm. see, and if he did see, doesn't matter. I love that he insists that he believes people are selfish and that no one's going to help this, this homeless person outside because I think it also informs someone like him. And I think someone like, I think him and Song Wu are very similar um, in that they believe that humans are intrinsically all out for themselves. And I think that that just to them, I think that that justifies their way of life to themselves. I think they have to tell themselves that. Here's a thought. Uh, I was going to say the old man says that, that he believes all people are inherently selfish and such even though throughout the squid games mm -hmm. i guess uh gihan is helping him out a lot mm -hmm. but when it came down to it with marbles gihan did deceive him yeah and lie yeah in order to survive he he played off the old man's perceived senility and was like oh you said odds or even yeah. and while this was happening i suspected that the old man was aware, self-aware, and knew that he was just playing along. And I, my first thought was like, oh, the old man really cares about Gihan. It's just going to let him win. He's going to let him win because, but then at the end, he's like, 
is it fair that you're taking advantage of my my mind and uh, doing this? So I wonder if in that instance, that solidified the old man's perspective yeah. that people are selfish because maybe throughout that time, he was starting to think, oh, this guy's helping me. Maybe people aren't all selfish. Then when it came down to it, Nope, Gihan did lie. But that it, that to me reminds me of the kind of rhetoric you hear people use in general just to justify that kind of viewpoint of like people are inherently bad is like when you put someone in a position where it's life or death, regardless of how much we see this main character helping the old man or helping other mm -hmm. other characters this entire time. You take one mistake. Yes, you, you, you know, you're like, fuck, it's life or death. I gotta, you know. You take one to, moment of I need to survive. And, yeah. and that's going to be like, well, ah, you fucked up. You know, mm -hmm. that means that all people are selfish. And so I, I think, yeah, a character like the old man go, probably won his whole life cherry picking stuff like that. Because I think to, to be this fucking evil billionaire, you know, this like, obscenely wealthy person you have to make those decisions and i think you have to believe that maybe humanity is inherently bad and maybe deserving of being you know put in their place on that note there is one thing in squid game that really separates it from a lot of other death game media and that's the fact that in the second episode of the show they are allowed to leave yes and have to come back Mm -hmm. huge quotes on this of their own free will. Yes. And I think that this is a huge part of the story and allegory that Squid Game is trying to tell because, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of death game media, Battle Royale, uh, first and foremost, people are captured, held against their will, forced to participate in these games until there's only one person left. That's it. In Squid Game, they have the first game and then they are told that at any time, if a majority of the players want to leave, the game will end. And so after that first game, after they've seen so many people die, a very slim majority, which is interesting, the the, yes. the vote is done by the old man. And I think later when you get the reveal, I think that that's him being like, well, if they don't want to play, then mm -hmm. they won't. But I think they'll come back. And all but I think 14 players end up deciding to come back. Because when they go back to life outside of Squid Game, they are reminded of how difficult it is just to survive. And we see throughout the second episode the lives of Ali and the main character and Sang Woo and the pickpocket mm -hmm. and how much they need money and how they don't have the chance. Even though they're doing all taking different approaches to find a way to survive. I think Ali is the most sympathetic because he has a job, yeah. is working. He's just getting his wages withheld by a shitty guy who's taking advantage of his immigration status. Yeah. And so you see why things are so hard for everyone that they feel the need to opt in. Again, to huge quotes. Yeah. And I think that it's basically saying, yeah, uh, capitalism and when people are doing poorly, you can say, oh, well, they're doing it of their own free will. And I've yeah, seen- Yeah, like you made those choices. You so made those choices. Fault. Yeah. Even though- that's not really a choice. Right. It's either, uh, I, I forget which character said it, but they're like, it's either die, take a long time slowly dying yeah. in the real world or take a chance at winning all this money. And if I die, then at least I yeah. don't have to suffer. I think the show does such a cool job of like doing this vote and there's characters that vote to stay where you're like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. You're like, why would you, why on earth would you stay here? You just saw so many people get shot and like, I don't, like the fact that it's such a slim vote, you're like, how? And then that second episode where you spend um, so much time with them outside, you end up at the end of that episode like, yeah, go back. And the fact that that show does that is so cool that you are then like, yeah, you gotta. And I, I think it's so important that it really puts you in their shoes and makes you realize how dire things must be for someone to choose to do that. And yeah, the, the key word is choice. When we talk about in, in real life, I, I think of like like student debt is a perfect example. Yeah. Um, student debt, so many people say like, well, you chose to take on student debt, which is true. You apply for extent, loans yeah. and, but is it really a choice when you live in a country where to work even like menial fucking minimum wage jobs, you have to have a college degree. Yeah. So I, I think that's starting to change a little bit, but for, at least for people our age, it was like, you have to you go to college. You have to go to college. And man, 
when you're High agreeing school, to all those, yeah. you're a fucking idiot, 17 or 18 year old. You don't know shit. Yeah. And if your parents didn't teach you financial literacy, you don't know shit. You don't understand the impact of what you're doing. I mean, you're the players life. signing up in the beginning of just being told that you're going to play a series of games and win money. Okay, sure. Sign up. And you don't know what it's going to be like. Yeah. You know, it's it's such a good parallel. And I, I mean, it's. I think it's why all the characters are shown to be in debt because debt is something like you technically do to yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's why it's so important that these characters do all choose to go back because we spend the rest of the series empathizing with them and being fucking angry on their behalf, knowing like and being there with them for that choice. And it's this false idea of fairness, like throughout the entire series is everyone here is equal. Everyone here has a fair chance. It's why, you know, they're like so um like strict about cheating and having. But like, obviously, that's not true. Like inherently, some people like in something like tug of war, um granted that is a, i love that sequence where the old man is like here's how we win a tug of war but like you know stuff like that where you're a big strong dude you have a leg up over it. and and that's how life is when you're living under capitalism like there's this fake idea of like well it's all fair because everyone's got a chance to win and you know fight their way to the top but that's not true exactly they reiterate over and over like when they execute the uh workers who are helping the doctor yeah which is a i enjoy that subplot of like i like uh, that too organ harvesting to get more money on top of whatever they're they're making you know cheating the system so that they can make more money they execute those guys because they're like we provide a fair playing field everything is fair here right. but let's look at the things that like you said uh, make it not so fair one genetic disposition mm -hmm. not everyone is born equally and so when it comes to something like tug of war where brute strength is a huge factor if you're born as a six five bulky guy yeah you're gonna have a huge leg up over uh someone like uh player 67 the pickpocket yeah. you know someone who is born in a smaller size to the luck of positioning mm -hmm. i think the bridge is a really good allegory yes. for um your your luck and fate depend partially and sometimes hugely on the position that you start off with. Yes. Whether that's like the position you're born in or what. And the people who've made mistakes before you. Yeah, learning from those people's mistakes, building off of them in some cases, like with Sangu at the end, sacrificing others to get ahead. And one of my favorite moments is the mathematician yeah. on the bridge who is he's going forward and then he counts the number of times uh, of squares he has in front of him. Each one is a 50, 50 shot. He does the math in his head. He has like a one in 32,000 yeah. chance of living. So he just fucking books it because he knows there's no, there's no fucking chance. Yeah. The, the odds are so tiny yeah. that there's no way he can get through. And then finally, even aside from genetics or just luck of the draw, you do have the people who are running the system working against you. The glassmaker mm -hmm. on the bridge. Mm -hmm. Finally, he has a skill that comes in handy. He has a knowledge that he worked. He said he worked years and years as a glassmaker. He he uh you know developed a skill and an expertise that great for him is finally going to come in handy and he can use that to get an advantage. Yeah. And what happens when he's using that? It's not as entertaining. It's not like as entertaining. VIPs. They change the rules. They turn off the lights. That guy dies. Right. Like that. It, it's yeah. The, the illusion of a fair playing field. Yeah. And it's, it's that illusion. And you know, it, it the illusion that um you can, w they, they do such a good job of convincing every person who comes back that it's like, maybe I can win, you know, maybe I'll, I'll get all the money. And that's kind of broadly, that's how it feels living, you know, the way we do too, where it's like, we all have, it's the American dream of like making it right. But if everyone, not everyone can make it the, like you, you can't have the system that like it's it's impossible like you can't have it where everyone makes it so it is like the mathematician on the bridge where you do the math and you're like oh the the chances of me making it are so low and that's the case you know that's that's and and, and but yet 
the carrot or like the literal piggy bank of money is such a powerful image you know, in the show and in real life, just this like fantasy idea of making it that we just ignore those odds and pretend like, yeah, but I'm going to be the exception. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be the one who somehow picks the correct pane of glass. And it's like a one in 32 something. And then thousand. the people who that does happen to be true for those people, the very few people who make it, it sucks when they take the song woo uh, mm. mentality of, oh, I made it because I earned it. Yes. As opposed to the Gihan mentality of, wait, no, we made it because everyone in front of us yeah. didn't make it. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I love those two characters um, and the ways that they kind of view other people and the way that they view their own, um, yeah, success at the end. Like, how did they get there? They have such, they've, they've played the same game and yet they have two totally different ideas on how they each, you know, reached their level of success is that, you know, they, they fought their way to the top. One believes that it was like, no, I did it because I survived. And it was, you know, I made it to the end. And the other one's like, well, you only made it because all these other people didn't. I think there is this kind of beautiful, like optimism to it, where I think the creator believes that if that weren't the case, and so many of us weren't, um, strangled by debt and having to fight every day and being forced to step on other people to to stay alive day to day make these choices that hurt other people that if we don't live under a system like that humans capacity for caring about each other is like really incredible and even living under a system like this people still will put their neck out for other people like our main character who um you know or Ali, who saves the main yeah, character. Yeah, Ali, who and, grabs, yeah, yeah um, uh, the main character, our main character who went on strike. They all kind of form a team. Like, even within the structure of Squid Game and at large, the kind of, you know, society that we live in where it's um, all about capital, it's a rat race, There, people, we see instances of people caring about each other and putting others before themselves and, you know, imagine what, we could accomplish if we didn't have to worry about, you know, if we didn't have, um, you know, this chokehold of debt or just, you know, having to every day chase money to survive. Like, what would that system be like if we were freed from from that weight, you know, the capacity of humans to to care and that money um isn't the only motivator to to do things in this world right like you know we humans care about other things than money we're forced to care about money mm -hmm. um but in you know inherently we care about each other i would think i think i i don't know i think that that's the show is optimistic in that way i think it truly believes that humans you know at, at our best care about each other as dark as the show is i think that its belief in humanity is like really kind of beautiful. And I, th I think maybe that's also why it resonates really hard right now too. Yeah. I mean, Gihan offers to end the game just to save Song Wu's life at the end. Yeah. When it's just the two of them. He's like, I, I will throw away all this money. Yeah. Even though this person is someone who just tried to kill me to save their life. And yeah. And Song Wu in one last uh, moment of, you know, face saving or, or redemption uh, kills himself. And I would you know, argue that's a, the villainous uh, turn, I think he, because he knows that a lot of that money is going to go to his his mom. Oh, or... sure. Yeah, but like, is it villainous to want your mom to be okay? No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I would say it's it's because, remember, if if they both quit, all of that money goes yeah. to the families. Of, and so then they're back to square one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, I've, I've seen interesting reads on his decision to do that. Um, it could also just be a pride thing. Who knows? Uh, before we wrap up, do you want to just hit on some things that we haven't discussed that maybe we should just uh, like lightning round of Squid Game opinions? Ooh. Um, for instance, we didn't mention the cop subplot at all. The detective looking yeah, for his brother who ends yeah. up being the front man. Yeah, the yeah. front man, like all that stuff, which I, I liked I because it, the whole every time we cut back to him, it was like I I don't know I was just so fucking tense that whole time. It was a good way to show the inner workings of that too because this game. I wanted to know so much more, and I'm kind of glad that you don't learn like everything about it. Yeah, we don't we don't need to need know who founded this when no, and like it's... the details. But I do like him going behind the scenes, and between that and the organ harvesting subplot, which intersect at yeah. a certain point. Uh, I loved seeing all that and just seeing 
who how these workers are just like the regular people. Yeah, and I like the reveal that they they show one of the workers and it's like a young guy mm -hmm. and it made me think of like how mil like you realize our military is like kids. Yeah. <laughs> like again, idiot 17, 18 year olds who don't yes. know what they're doing. And 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 you know, thinking like I need some I can't pay for college. I'm going to you know what? I'm going to sign on for the military cuz then I won't have student debt. I'm mm -hmm. going but now you've made a choice and you're one of the pink suited dudes at this uh, game. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's that that character, that unmasking was very intentionally like a young kid. Uh, there's also the woman who is in the uh, the romantic on and off with oh, Snake. Oh, yeah. I forget her name. She's, She's fantastic. She's so fun. The lady with the long hair. Yeah. I just love shit. that actress and like her... I don't know that that character's so fun. Like she, I, I you go from like really enjoying her to just fucking hating her like every few minutes. Yeah, She's yeah, it goes so... back and forth so much. I do love when she doesn't get picked for Marvels and then they come back and she's just like laying in bed, just like I, what up? I saw a very interesting <laughs> theory that they the old man expected not to be picked yeah he expected to just use that opportunity to like head back to be the host again and right just be like okay exiting the game yeah but instead gihan picked him mm -hmm. and uh yeah so i guess they just like left her in as an agent of chaos it's like when you have uh edge of extinction and you're like oh wait let's get another player back in yeah. there because they're just too chaotic mm -hmm. i also <laughs> i kind of wish that uh, when she grabbed Snake and fell back, that like they fell back onto a tempered glass. I had that thought <laughs> just too. The they just of, like, the clung, like it just <laughs> this echoing noise, and it's just really uncomfortable. I, I think everyone had that thought watching that scene. Like, but how? What if she just falls on the? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, God, what else? The husband wife. Fuck. Ooh, I'm glad that they don't show the marble game between them. We don't like, need to. All you need to know is is them. All you need to see is them realizing what the rules that's are, it. and that's yeah. it. And then, and then him <sighs> killing himself later. It makes sense. I think that was the scene I had mentioned previously, where like it cuts and it's the VIPs being like, ah, fuck. Like, oh, and, that's right. And it yeah, just that's ninety six. Made me yeah. like. It just hit me really mm -hmm. hard, I think. Just the callous, like... They're like, oh, you fucking idiot. Yeah. Yeah, because he lost I, That money. scene, as yeah. much as people hate the... I think especially right there, that moment of that their shitty commentary, it, like, hit me so hard. And mm -hmm. I think it was really effective. Um, Just, like, how dismissive they were of it and how much they... Yeah, they just treat it like a game, which, like, I mean, that's kind of what this is to the, the uber-wealthy... The uber-wealthy... You know that people are dying every day. Like, it's fucking Squid Game out there. Everyone, yeah. you know, we're all killing each other. And it's like, they could do something. They, the VIPs could stop the game. And mm -hmm. no, it's, you know, fuck, fuck. I was saying how I love the red light, green light doll. And I want an animatronic for our front lawn. I really who will, want. Who will say it and then turn around. And, and the, the eyes, eyes will be yeah, go all around. And then I, I was like, and with gun sound, oh, no, no, not no, with no, the gun no, sound no, effects. No, no. You can just turn back around and start that loop again. Yeah. <laughs> but, I would love that. Mm -hmm. I think that the big, that was like a real animatronic. It was. And, and I wouldn't be shocked if they end up making it because that thing's already becoming iconic. Oh, like, yeah. Visually, you know. I People are going to be, I think that's, that is, I think maybe the last thing I want to talk about um, in regards to why I think the show is so great. Like, I was trying to, I, I made the thumbnail for this video last night and I could What'd not with? Yeah. choose what to, because so many, which I think is amazing. I, I used a row of the guys in the pink. Okay. Um, That's the, the most yeah. iconic. But I think the, the fact that there's so many visually like instantly, like the, the, um, the candy with like the umbrella mm -hmm. in it and the big doll and even just like the green track suits, the guy with the red and the blue, um, the envelopes at the oh yeah, um, there, there's so many visually, like you just like visually memorable, and I think that that I think it's maybe not getting enough credit for that alone. Like it's so amazing how many things like I couldn't decide what would make the best thumbnail because there's so many things that are recognizable from this show. Yeah, it's tough to make something that has that kind of resonance uh like immediate resonance and recognition when you see it yeah and just the number of things with this show like the playground you yeah know, there's it, so many different things like yeah 
Uh, it's great. It's I think good. it's really the the business card with the symbols. On oh yeah, it is another yeah. good one. Like the the, the coffin boxes. Like mm-hmm. there's yeah, so many cool visual choices. Um, the, and just all the, good the VIP design. masks and stuff. Yeah, the front man. Like the de- yeah, the front man. Like the design of everything in this show is so memorable. I think it's it's really incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we could talk much longer, but we. I mean, you do have to edit this. I have to edit this in. <laughs> less than a day because we've been so busy um but busy in a good way thank you by the way everyone who came out last night for our screening of halloween kills with dave gordon green if you only listen to the podcast and you're like what the fuck i didn't even get the chance to mention it on the podcast because you mentioned it in a kill count and it instantly like sold out uh was it even in a kill count? no it was, was the jamie a- lee interview oh it was a jamie lee, the- yeah which also i mean just in general Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us for all these years because your uh, devoted fan base is the reason Universal's being like, do you want to interview Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah. You know, like, we wouldn't have these opportunities without you guys, no matter how good the content we were making. Yeah. If you weren't there, we wouldn't have these things. And so the fact you. the screening with David Gordon Green, it was a screening for Dead Meat fans that David Gordon Green came to. Yeah. It was incredible. Just came I, to a theater full of Dead Meat we, fans. We decided after last night, because it was such a, a success and I had such a great time, we want to do more of those. Because it's a win. For everyone, it's a win win. Like, we get to you know, interview someone cool. We get to meet a bunch of you guys because we stuck around after the movie and met so many of you and we hadn't talked in person with fans in like Dude, over a year. I shake hands. I love shaking yeah. hands. And the fact that the screening was free for everyone. It was a free screening it was a free for movie. the people game yeah. in advance. Yeah. You know? It's it's went like it's Everybody great. wins. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. <laughs> um, unlike Squid Game at our screenings, <laughs> everyone wins. Um, it's great. I, I, if we do more of those, obviously we will let you know all about them. For sure, yeah. yeah. So, great. Thank you everyone who came out to that and thank you for listening to this episode, our very unstructured uh, freeform discussion of this, Squid Game. This is, <laughs> it's still not the midpoint of this month, but we're coming up on the midpoint of this month. We've got so much more ahead for you, assuming we don't drop while we're trying to make it. Yeah. What's next on the podcast, hon? Um, <laughs> if we have, I'm hoping we have time for it. Yes, I'll make it work. We okay. got to make it work. We'll make it Okay, so there was this movie <laughs> that when I was in high school, my two best friends and I would rent like every weekend from Hollywood Video called Predator Island. Um, no, I promise you've never seen it. I don't know how. I think we just picked it based on the cover, which is weird because the cover is not that interesting. It's like nope. the most generic, like early 2000s horror cover. Also, the name Predator is not good nowadays. But I think that that's, that's like Epstein Island. But I think that's why we picked is because like Predator Island sounds so sketch. Yeah. So that might be why we we picked it, and it became this movie that we were obsessed with. Like it's so um, it's very low budget. I don't know how what else it to looks, say. About it looks it. like Jack Frost two budget. Y- yeah, it's um, yeah, we were obsessed with it. One time we asked the guy at Hollywood Video if we could look at the records of who had checked it out. And we looked and it was just us every week. And we asked if we could buy it. And he said no. (laughs) Um, But I have my own copy now. And I really want to introduce all of you to Predator Island. James included. He's never seen it. I've never seen it. I don't know. Fuck all about this movie. And I I refuse to watch it unless one of my best one of the two best friends who i watched it with every weekend who also lives out here now is going to join us for that i refuse to watch it without her so so that'll be next week <laughs> yeah <laughs> from squid game to predator island dude the, <laughs> the gap in there's uh, no bigger gap possible between i don't think popularity. week to week i do, yeah oh there's yeah. no possible way no you can take something more popular or less popular yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah. pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. cool. Um, social media? Yeah. Dead Meat James on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I'm at Carebeck, C-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. So look forward to the rest of this month. Uh, we will look forward to having done it all. Yes. <laughs> and it'll be, it'll be great. Yeah. But until next time, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. Oh, you messed up this time. <laughs> oh. <laughs>